Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm Dr. Steve Brooks. I work over at Barton Primary Care in State Line, and I've been in practice in State Line for over 30 years now. Um, I don't come over to the California side, so I see some faces that I'm not familiar with. And I'm here tonight to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, which is high blood pressure. And obviously, you guys must be interested as you're all here tonight. Um, high blood pressure is a pretty significant problem all over the world, in fact. Um, normal blood pressure we define as 120 over 80. Um, in this area between 120 over 80 and 140 over 90, it, it's considered like a borderline area or um, elevated blood pressure, but a lot of it depends on your overall health and your overall other disease processes. If you have heart disease, a history of stroke, chronic kidney disease, then we really try to target the number to be 120 over 80. Um, this number has fluctuated uh, in recent years, and it depends on which society you want to follow. I follow the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association, which recommends 120 over 80 if that's possible. If your blood pressure is between 120 over 80 and 140 over 90, and you're pretty healthy, and you have no other disease process going on, sometimes we can try uh, to do some risk factor modification to get your blood pressure under control. So you can see here it's a pretty big problem in the United States. Even in young people, 7% of people between 20 and 34 have high blood pressure. Between ages 55 and 64, 54%, and over 75, 78% of people have high blood pressure. So your blood pressure does rise as you get older. So high blood pressure, you know, it, you know it's not too exciting, um, but it, it can cause a lot of um, serious diseases. As you can see here, it, it's a major cause of premature death and disease. It can lead to strokes, heart failure, um, sexual dysfunction, kidney disease, heart attack, and sometimes problems with your eyes. Um, one thing I should mention to you guys, if, if I say something you have a question about, please raise your hand. I, I like to make this interactive, and, and so please don't hesitate to ask me any questions about something I just said. It's no problem. So around the globe, they estimate that 9.4 million people die from high blood pressure related diseases. That's, that's quite a bit worldwide. <coughs> Symptoms of high blood pressure, oftentimes there are none, but what I see in my practice often is people will be having some headaches, some fatigue, maybe some ringing in their ears, maybe they'll feel some pressure in their chest with exercise, or their exercise capacity is reduced. Sometimes um, they, they have this nice slide up here. This, this is um, swelling of the legs. They're using the British swelling there, uh, spelling there. Um, edema is leg swelling. Um, we mentioned difficulty breathing and chest pain. And, uh, but oftentimes there are no symptoms. And a lot of times this is discovered like if you go for a routine doctor's appointment, a physical, you go to your dentist, you go to your eye doctor, and they'll say, hey, your blood pressure's high. So that is the most common scenario is people, I find it on physical exams or referral from other healthcare providers. The important thing is to confirm that people really do have high blood pressure. Sometimes when people come to doctor's offices, they get a little bit nervous and their blood pressure goes up and, and that's fairly common. So we really want confirmation that you really have high blood pressure. And we really want to see that people have three definite readings that are over 140 over 90. A lot of times if we suspect people get nervous in the doctor's office, we used to call this white coat hypertension. We suggest they get a blood pressure monitor. There's also um, equipment called ambulatory blood pressure monitors. Um, not a lot of doctors use those because you wear a blood pressure monitor for 24 to 48 hours. It records all the information and then the doctor gets a report. The problem is it, it, it's expensive, a lot of times insurance don't cover it, and then it's a one-time shot. You don't get to keep it. So a lot of times I ask my patients to buy a home blood pressure monitor 
and monitor their blood pressure at home. And I have them bring it in, in my office so I can watch them and make sure they're doing it right and make sure that their cuff correlates well with the cuff that we use. The electronic cuffs, you guys may have seen those. They fit on your arm and you press a button and it pumps it up and then it gives you a reading. And some of these machines have um, memory. It can store up to 30 readings. Sometimes I'll have people like keep a log where they'll just write it down and show it to me when they come in. But it's important that we verify that the monitor works. And oftentimes, um, even people with high blood pressure on medicine, their blood pressure will be higher in my office than it is at home. So th this is very valuable information. And I tell people, if you buy a monitor, don't buy the least expensive, but you don't have to buy the most expensive because sometimes um, the quality, if you buy a really uh, low quality one, they, they're not that accurate. And it's also very important to, to uh, put the cuff on right. And the, I like the arm cuffs, okay? Most doctors like the arm cuffs. The wrist, you have a lot of bones around here. I was just at my dentist today and they use the wrist cuff and that's not as accurate. So we like the arm cuff and I tell people to, your brachial artery, which we're measuring, is on the inside of your elbow. You can actually feel it if you kind of poke around in there. And so we like the, the hose that's on the, the home cuff to come in line with your pinky or your ring finger. And you can use either arm, doesn't matter. Um, you want to check your blood pressure after you've been kind of resting, not running around, you know, doing stuff around the house or working in your yard. You want to be at rest when you take your blood pressure. And it's also important in the doctor's office. Yes? I'm wondering if you don't have it on that exact spot, do you just don't get a reading or do you get any? You may get a reading? false, falsely false. elevated or falsely low even. So yeah, it, it's got to be on the right spot. Yes? Yeah. Right. There are two blood, well, actually, there's three. There's a child size, an average adult size, and then a large size. Um, most people would be like an average size. If people have a large arm, we use a large cuff. Yeah. And if they have a really skinny arm, we, can, we have a pediatric cuff we can use too. Any other questions regarding this? Yeah. Probably like five minutes. In an ideal world, we would uh, have you come into our office, introduce ourselves, have you sit in the room for five minutes, have you relax and come back and check your blood pressure. But that's not real practical. So in most offices, the medical assistant brings you back. They take your blood pressure. Um, my office is on the second floor now, and people have to walk up the stairs. And I just moved in this office about six months ago, and I've been finding the initial blood pressure is a little bit higher. Um, and so I, I always take a second blood pressure reading, uh, typically, uh, unless it's just perfect and I don't want to ruin it. No, I, I, usually, I usually take a second reading myself. I think that's important. Um, yes? Why does it go up as we get older? Good question. Um, the arteries get stiffer as we get older. Um, and it's probably that and environmental factors that we haven't really um, figured out. I think our diets affect that too. Um, a lot of our diets in the United States aren't that good. A lot of people eat processed foods. I'm, I'm going to get into that in a little bit. Ah. So treatment, the, we usually will try lifestyle modification in some patients. If your blood pressure is very elevated, if you have heart disease, kidney disease, history of stroke, we want to get you on some medicine right away and then if you can get lifestyle modification, we can adjust the medication. Another important thing everybody should know is blood pressure medication, it's not addictive. So if you start on blood pressure medication, and let's say you change your diet, you start exercising, you lose weight, and your blood pressure starts dropping, we can stop the medicine. It doesn't go up and stay up because you've taken a medicine. So that's, that's a misconception that a lot of people have. Salt is a really big factor in high blood pressure. And uh, we probably get too much salt in our diet here in the United States. Uh, any processed foods are very high in salt. So anything that comes in a can, a bag, a box, that is usually very high in sodium. So if you are buying foods like that, read, start reading the labels and see how much sodium is in that. If you can keep your sodium intake below 3,000 
milligrams a day, that's pretty good. It's not too hard to achieve. Um, if you have heart failure or kidney disease, we like to see that number at 2,000 milligrams of sodium a day. It's kind of hard to calculate sodium sometimes. So the message on that is the more fresh food you eat, fresh vegetable, fresh fruit, um, fresh meats, things that you make at home, is a much healthier way to eat for you. Smoking. Smoking definitely causes high blood pressure. In fact, any type of nicotine intake, whether it be chewing tobacco, uh, vaping, not a lot, vaping's popular now, smoking, all that raises your blood pressure. So we try to get people to quit smoking. Uh, smoking, it, it's really hard for a lot of people to quit, but we really encourage them, and I usually bug people about smoking quite a bit if they are smokers. Alcohol. We, we used to think that alcohol was kind of good for you. For a while there, it was a you know, popular idea to, that a, a man could have two drinks a day or two glasses of wine, a woman could have one. Obviously, that study was done by a man. Um, <laughs> but I, I read an article recently in, in a medical journal, of course, that they're, they're thinking that alcohol isn't that good for you, that maybe any alcohol is not that good for you. They're implicating alcohol in um, certain cancers. Um, alcohol does turn into sugar in your body. Sugar's bad for you. Um, and too much sugar probably contributes to some type of cancers. So um, yeah, I was kind of surprised. That was the first time I'd seen that years ago. I was like, oh yeah, I'll drink two glasses of wine a day. It's good for your heart, you know. Um, but uh, we're kind of getting away from that. So I tell people to drink as little alcohol as possible. Um, you know, maybe reserve for special occasions. Um, probably daily alcohol use is not as good as we once thought it was. Weight loss. Um, weight affects blood pressure. The more you weigh, the higher your blood pressure. And we find that for every pound you lose, it equals about one point of blood pressure. So if you lose 20 pounds, you can get like 10 to 20 points of blood pressure lowering. Now, you know, that's, that's hard for people to do though, weight loss, but Another thing we encourage people to do, exercise. Exercise is very important and you know, I want to clarify what we define as exercise. Um, we live in Lake Tahoe, there's people doing marathons, doing ultra marathons, riding the death ride. You don't have to exercise like that, okay? What we like you to do is 150 minutes of exercise a day and that could be a brisk walk or even, even just walking, okay? If, if, you're, you, if you're older, you've had arthritis, you can't walk fast, just get out and walk. They've even done studies on people with advanced heart failure, and if they walk, they will live longer than the people that don't walk. So it's really important to exercise, and, and so we use the number 150 minutes per week, or you know, uh, 30 minutes five days a week. Oh, I'm sorry, 150 minutes per week. So, so, oh, I'm sorry. So. <laughs> So 30 minutes a day, I'm sorry, thank you for correcting me. 30 minutes a day, five days a week, okay? 30 times five, yeah. And great, if you can ride your bike you know, up a hill you know, for 30 minutes, fabulous. Um, but uh, we have so many wonderful trails here in Lake Tahoe. It's just great to get outside and walk and we live in such a beautiful place. And I, I do a lot of walking. I used to run until my knees gave out, but I still enjoy riding my bicycle. But walking is great. Stress reduction. Um, stress reduction is also very important. Um, I understand some people have very difficult jobs, they're very stressful. Uh, it, really, it really does affect you. And we try to encourage people to work on stress reduction. Um, I recommend trying yoga if you can't do yoga. Deep breathing is, is really important. Meditation. When you're doing yoga and meditation, you're concentrating on lowering your, your breathing rate. And, you're supposed to take deep breaths, hold your breath slightly, exhale slowly. And believe it or not, that actually lowers people's blood pressure by deep breathing. Um, so stress reduction is very important. I, you know, some people are in a very difficult job and if they can't get a handle on it, I, you know, I say, you know, I can't tell you what to do, but you gotta consider changing jobs because I've seen people, their blood pressure be uncontrolled because they're under so much stress and you know, I keep giving them more medicine, but unless they get to the root cause. Night shift workers in Tahoe, and we're in a hospital environment here, uh, 
people that work night shift tend to have higher blood pressure. Uh, humans were not made to work at night. If you think about it, we haven't evolved to be working nights. We only had electricity, what, a little over 100 years ago. Most people were asleep at night and worked during the day. And in modern society, a lot of people work nights. And that actually, it's hard on your health, not just blood pressure, a lot of other health issues related to night shift work. Um, any questions on any of this? I do want to point out that genetics, I don't have a slide on genetics, but genetics is very powerful. If you have a family history of high blood pressure, there's a good chance you're going to get it. And, and what I mean by that, it's, it's your, your parents and your siblings. My general rule, if, if you have a parent or sibling with high blood pressure, you're at risk. If you have a parent and a sibling with high blood pressure, you're probably going to get it. I mean, there's nothing you can do. And I have some patients that literally um, do marathons, uh, do triathlons. Um, they can't do any of this. I mean, they're already doing everything, and they, they just have to take medicine. So there, there are some people that really there's, there's nothing you can do. You just have to accept your fate. But in a younger person who is pretty healthy and doesn't have other risk factors, like heart disease, stroke, kidney disease, I, I will oftentimes uh, recommend that if their blood pressure is only mildly elevated. Again, if it's really high, a lot of times I'll start people on medicine if that appears to be what they need, and then the plan will be, hey, you know, get, get this under control and we can try to wean you off of it. Is if you don't have control um, blood pressure, is excessive exercise dangerous? It can be, yes, because while you're exercising, blood pressure does go up. But after you exercise, it goes down. So that, good question. Um, so if people's blood pressure is really high and uncontrolled, I recommend they don't exercise, you know, hard at least until their blood pressure is under control. You know, walking is, is acceptable. Um, I oftentimes tell people, you know, you can keep doing what you've been doing if your blood pressure is high. And if it's really high, we, we discourage exercise and at least strenuous exercise until we get it under control. Yes? I got salt food salt up at the top of the list, um, and I noticed like junk food, added food, cookies, and ice cream, whatever, they seem to drive the pressure up too. Is it because of the salt content in those foods that they're processed, or uh, is it something why you didn't mention it? It's, it's probably a combination of, of salt and then sugar too, because sugar, uh, when you eat like you know, desserts and sugary foods, your, your body secretes a hormone called insulin. You guys have probably heard of insulin. Um, too much insulin is really bad for you. It causes weight gain, it causes diabetes, and it can be a contributor to high blood pressure. Okay, medications. I prescribe a lot of these. Um, I don't know if any of you are on blood pressure medication, but um, I, will, I will talk about these. Um, uh, we live in an area where a lot of people are active. Uh, they enjoy hiking, bike riding, skiing. You know, you guys know all the activities we enjoy up here. And um, I've kind of um, ta tailored my treatment of high blood pressure to our environment and the people and the person's activity level. If you read the uh, the guidelines, most uh, experts would recommend start people on a diuretic. A diuretic. It basically eliminates salt out of your body, but it also can dehydrate you. So if you're pretty active, and especially in the summer, you're, you're gonna have problems on that medication. If we really need it, we, we add it. Um, a lot of experts are now uh, recommending to consider starting with one of these agents on the top of the list, the ACE inhibitors or the angiotensin receptor blockers. If I had high blood pressure, I would, I would take that. Um, what an ACE inhibitor does is lisinopril, I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but it's a common blood pressure drug that, that a lot of us use. ACE inhibitor, it, inhib it inhibits an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme, and um, it has a lot of really positive benefits, ACE inhibitors do. Uh, it actually helps the health of the art artery. Um, uh, it increases the nitric oxide within the artery, which relaxes the artery. It actually can cause some uh, improvement in, in the disease inside the, we call it the endothelium, which is the inside of the artery. Um, it actually, ACE inhibitors also have been shown, as well as ARBs, 
have been shown to help uh, remodel the, the ventricle. Um, your left ventricle is your main pumping chamber, your heart, and a lot of people with high blood pressure can develop an enlarged left ventricle. And the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs have been shown to reduce that, and I've actually seen that in my practice on um, both EKG and electrocardiogram. It's, you know, makes me happy. Uh, um, but uh, a lot of times, if the blood pressure is not really high, and I, I, I would usually start an ACE inhibitor because I think you get a lot of benefit from that. Diuretics, like I said, are recommended by most experts, but they dehydrate you. They can raise your uric acid level, actually raise your blood glucose and your triglyceride level in your blood. And so um, I, I add diuretics. If the ACE inhibitor is not working, I add a diuretic. Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask you, what is, where does that load pen by sulfate? Okay. That's what I take. That's, oh, that's what that's, that yeah, is. Yeah, oh, okay. just yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would know. Just 10 milligrams. I think that's yeah. low, right? Yeah. That, that, no, that's that about, that's, that's one yeah, course? yeah. That's a good medicine. I use, I use that quite often, yeah. Um, and ACE inhibitors, they have a uh, side effect of a cough. And the an enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme, is in your lungs. So about 10% of people will get a cough on lisinopril. Uh, sometimes it's a throat clearing. Sometimes it's a dry, it's usually a dry cough or a tickle in your throat, and usually if we eliminate that, that goes away. If you do get a cough on an ACE inhibitor, many physicians would go next to this medication, and it is similar to an ACE inhibitor, but it doesn't affect the ACE enzyme, so you don't get a cough from it. And um, I, I like those medications. This medication has very few side effects. In fact. Uh, on a study of a, a drug called Diavan or Valsartan, when they did some of the original studies, more people had, it was a double-blinded study, more people had side effects on the placebo medicine than actual <laughs> medicine. So, it's kind of interesting, yeah, yeah. Um, so these are commonly used. Um, the good news is all of these medications now come generic. So, you know, cost shouldn't be too much of an issue for everybody. Calcium channel blockers are very commonly used. That's um, amlodipine or Norvasc. Um, we tend to use that one when we want to use a calcium channel blocker. There are other calcium channel blockers like deltiazem and verapamil. And I'll use those when people have heart-related conditions. Those do affect um, the heart a little bit. Uh, they're antiarrhythmic, so it'll control uh, people that have atrial fibrillation and, and high blood pressure. But most doctors use Norvasc or amlodipine like, like you were taking. And we often use combinations of these. One thing I should mention, uh, most people do require two medications to control their blood pressure. Uh, oftentimes people require three. I do have a few people on all, all of these. Um, yeah, so um, diuretics we talked about. Hydrochlorothiazide is commonly used. Chlorthalidone is another commonly used one. Um, Lasix or furosemide is another one but that tends to be used more in people with heart disease or kidney disease. Um, it does give you a lot of, um, the, the term pee like a racehorse came from Lasix or furosemide, <laughs> if you ever heard that term. So, um, I use a lot of hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, what we notice with that is when people start that medication, the first two weeks you tend to urinate more and then it seems to lessen. Some patients tell me I keep, I can't stop urinating on it and oftentimes those are older men and we get prostate issues. So, but diuretics are very commonly used. Um, beta blockers, beta blockers were very popular. They're losing a lot of uh, favor in, in treatment of high blood pressure as they, they're not great blood pressure medications. Um, there's some newer type of beta blockers that we use that have a dual effect, carvedilol or labetalol. I don't know if you guys ever heard of those. Those um, have a, a dual acting effect. We like using those nowadays. Um, there's some studies saying that beta blockers don't prevent strokes and we're trying to prevent strokes. So I don't use a lot of them. They're very good, beta blockers are very good in the people who have heart problems like arrhythmias or um, heart disease, um, coronary artery disease, because they're heart protective. But they slow your heart rate down. So somebody who's really athletic, they can't get their heart up high enough to to ride their bicycle up Kingsbury Grade or something like that. So I, I, again, a lot of a lot of treatment is tailored to the individual person's lifestyle and their other risk factors. 
But um, again, um, I read a recent review preparing for this lecture, and um, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology have put these down, keep, keep putting beta blockers further down the list for treatment of isolated high blood pressure. Aldosterone antagonists, spironolactone, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that, I don't expect you to. Um, these are, um, this is sometimes, a, like I call it the magic bullet, if I got people on three medications and nothing's working, or it's, I should say if it's not coming down nice like I wanted to, I will start them on um, spironolactone, and it inhibits an enzyme. Aldosterone is produced by your adrenal glands, and uh, I think I've got a slide on adrenal gland disorders. Um, so these are the commonly used medications. Uh, it's interesting on this slide, there's, this is a lot of um, prostate medications on here. <laughs> that, but, you know, for a while, um, these medications lower your blood pressure, okay? But there was a study done showing that people that were on these medications for high blood pressure actually had worse outcomes than people that took the the medications on, on, these, on this list here, but this is just the slide we had, so forgive us. Um, a lot of um, older men are put on these medications for their prostate, and um, if you guys, anybody in here taking medicine for your prostate, um, and you're on other blood pressure medication, make sure your urologist knows that you're on blood pressure medication, because uh, these medications have a Bad side effect, which is fainting. These, these guys here, fainting, very common. So um, I don't use these for blood pressure. Um, if a older man really needs the, the, it's called an alpha blocker. If he really needs that for his prostate, I can lower his other blood pressure medicines so we're not making him get too low and, and faint. Any other, any questions? Yes? Without getting too technical, I was going to ask the question if you could explain Okay, good, good question. Um, right, well, what, what salt does is it increases the volume in your, your blood volume, basically. So um, it, salt is in your, your system, and it actually um, expands the volume of your blood. And so when we give you a diuretic and we, you urinate out the sodium, the salt, then that actually contracts your, your vascular volume and your blood pressure goes down. So diuretics, people call them water pills, they're really, they're really salt removing pills. Any other questions about medication? Yeah. That's pretty rare. Yeah. Yeah. That could have been other factors because there's, you know, it's a moving target. Um, yeah. Sometimes there's other factors going on. Um, but, you know, I, I really haven't seen that. Um, I've had patients ask me that, you know, since I've been on this, my blood pressure is going up. And, you know, usually they're on a low dose. Um, um, and then I'll try to convince them to take more <laughs> <laughs> and see if it comes down. But, uh, but you know, some medications can affect your kidney function. So if it's really high, you know, oftentimes we and we're worried, we'll do a blood test to measure your kidney function. It's a simple and inexpensive blood test. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else regarding medication? I think we we talked about um, a lot of this already. Uh, most people do require two or more medications. Um, I do have a lot of people controlled on one. I think uh, in, in our area here, a lot of people do enjoy exercising. They tend to eat healthier, I think. Um, and so I do get away with one medication in a lot of people. And, and the bottom line is, you know, we want to get to 120 over 80 if we can. I have some patients that 120 over 80 is too low and they get dizzy. and we don't want people to fall down, especially as people get older. You know, falls can be catastrophic. So 
In older people, if they're getting dizzy from the medication, I will lower it a little bit and take a little bit of risk because if, God forbid, somebody falls and breaks a hip, it could be a life-changing event and, you know. So again, we try to, if we are using medication, we, we look at the, the people's um, other risk factors for, you know, other disease processes going on. Um, if people have heart problems, I oftentimes will go to a beta blocker a little bit early. Um, I think I covered that pretty much. Okay, resistant hypertension. The number, okay, resistant hypertension means your blood pressure is not going down even though you're being prescribed two or three or four, maybe even five medications. The most common cause of resistant hypertension is people aren't taking all their medications. I, I have a couple of patients that um, they have to take five medications to control their blood pressure, but they don't like doing that. And um, I, they oftentimes tell me they are taking everything, but then I find out maybe they're not. And so I'll have them make sure they're taking everything and come back and see me. Um, so that is the most common cause of resistant hypertension is people not taking their medications as prescribed. And, you know, I understand nobody's perfect, but I always like people to tell me what's really going on because, you know, how can I help you as your doctor if you don't really tell me everything? And some people are embarrassed or, or you know, they can't afford, you know, five copays a month. And, you know, that's, that's just the way it is now. But I, I, you know, I like people to be honest with me. Sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a hot topic these days. Um, um, do you, do people in the audience, do you know what sleep apnea is? Does anybody know? So sleep apnea is when you are sleeping at night and your airway partially occludes and you tend to stop breathing. And sleep apnea we know now can lead to obesity, uh, diabetes, heart problems, high blood pressure, uh, arrhythmias. And so sleep apnea, most people see the apnea are overweight. Um, you know, the, the patient I think of is, you know, a man with a big beer belly comes in, he's probably got sleep apnea. Um, there's also something called central sleep apnea, and I do have one patient with that, and that's where the brain is not sending a signal to breathe. And um, this individual, uh, he's uh, very thin, fit, eats right, but he has central sleep apnea, so he has to use a machine at night. And these machines are hard to use. Um, I, I tell people we can diagnose sleep apnea. The treatment is difficult because I know if you put a mask on me at night, I, I, it'd, be, it'd be hard to sleep. Some people tell me, oh, I'm sleeping so much better. I feel so much better. Um, but some people, you know, it's about 50-50. Some people just can't tolerate it, um, the, the mask that is. Um, there were surgeries done for sleep apnea in the past that we're not really doing that much anymore. They aren't really successful uh, sleep apnea surgery. They usually try to cut off your uvula, which is people call it the punching bag in the back of your throat, or trim your, your flapper back there. Those surgeries really don't work too good. If people have very large tonsils, uh, sometimes we'll see sleep apnea in a child because their tonsils are so big. And so in that case, we'll take the tonsils out. Yes, sir. What about these devices you see advertised on TV for snoring? You mean like a mouth guard yeah, type? Like, well, okay. Yeah, so good question, thank you. Um, so some people will respond to a oral appliance which keeps your jaw in place. Um, it's like a mouth guard. And um, what, what happens is uh, the tongue actually slips back into the airway and it, it, it occludes your airway so you stop breathing. Um, so, um, no, no, no. So what that device does is it um, pulls your jaw forward and um, it helps in about one out of three people. So I do recommend those to people. Uh, there's several dentists in town that do make those. So if you have sleep apnea, ask your dentist if they do make those for you. And those aren't super expensive. Um, the CPAP equipment, a lot of insurances cover. Every few years, you got to get new tubing and this and that. But and it's also important to keep the sleep apnea machines, uh, the CPAP machines, clean. Um, you get infections from them. Is snoring an indication of sleep apnea? It can be, but everybody snores a little bit. Um, oftentimes, um, 
somebody will come in and they'll say my spouse tells me I'm snoring and I stop breathing and you know ask them a few questions and go over their medical history and sometimes we'll order we can order what's called an overnight oximetry which is a test we can do in the house it we put a oxygen monitor on your finger for one or two nights and it'll record all your your oxygen readings and your breathing pattern all through the night and if it looks like you have sleep apnea we'll send you to the sleep lab and get a formal sleep study done and then some of the sleep labs if you do have sleep apnea they'll do what's called a CPAP titration study where they put it on you and measure the, the pressure needed to uh, to alleviate the sleep apnea any other questions about sleep apnea we do have a sleep lab here at Barton Okay, elevated uh, aldosterone, we talked about that briefly. That's a hormone produced by the adrenal gland. Some people have that. Um, I can usually tell because people with high levels of aldosterone have a low uh, potassium. Um, and so if I see a low potassium in somebody that has high blood pressure and we're having a hard time controlling it, I can order an aldosterone level or sometimes I'll just put them on the medication which is spironolactone and then if it goes down we know, okay, yeah. You got that, so we, don't, we can save you um, from getting more testing done. Narrowing of the renal artery or the artery of the kidneys. That is rare in most people. It, 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 there is a disease called fibromuscular dysplasia, usually seen in young ladies. And if it's a young lady with high blood pressure, oftentimes we'll order an imaging test of the, the arteries to the kidney or the renal arteries to see if they have this. And that can be corrected with a stent placed into the renal artery. In older people, uh, stenting the renal artery is not very effective, so we don't do that as much as people get older. Chronic kidney disease is pretty common. Uh, it, uh, high blood pressure can cause chronic kidney disease, and chronic kidney disease makes your blood pressure go higher. So the goal is to keep your blood pressure down at, at a younger age. Um, it, it's important to get get on the treatment of high blood pressure if you have it as young as you possibly can if you really do have it because if you have it uncontrolled it can affect your kidneys and your heart and the analogy I like to use is um, it's like a pump it's like a water system your, your heart is the pump and your blood vessels are the pipes so if you have high blood pressure that pump is going to get tired the pump's going to break the pipe's going to blow out so think of your cardiovascular system like a like a pumping system which essentially it is Adrenal gland tumors, uh, pheochromocytoma. Um, I won't expect you guys to say that. Um, it's, a, it's pretty rare. It's a, it's a tumor that produces um, adrenaline, and uh, they're pretty rare. I've seen maybe one or two in my whole 30-plus uh, year career. And um, what will happen is people get spikes of high blood pressure. They have rapid heartbeat. They're flushing. And to diagnose that, we do a urine test to measure uh, chemicals in your urine over a 24-hour period, but those are pretty rare. Over-the-counter medication, uh, Advil and Aleve. I think we're living in an Advil society right now. Um, seems like everybody takes it by the handful. Um, it's, it's actually, uh, Advil and Aleve, we're finding it's really not that good for you. It does work on pain, um, and we're getting away from other pain medications, so a lot more people are taking it, but it is really uh, affects your blood pressure quite a bit. And if I see somebody's blood pressure really high and I'm questioning them how much ibuprofen do you take, oh, I've taken a, you know, 1,200, 1,800 milligrams a day, I try to get them off of that and recommend they take Tylenol. Uh, Advil and Aleve are called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and they, they can affect your kidneys. Tylenol does not affect your kidneys and the whole thing with Tylenol in your liver, I think that's a bit blown out of proportion. If you don't drink alcohol, Tylenol, is a safe medication. Um, unfortunately, it's not the greatest analgesic. It's not as strong as Advil or Aleve. Yes? I, I haven't gotten it, but what is, what, is ibuprofen at Advil? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. I sh ibuprofen, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I should have, uh, yeah, yeah, ibuprofen is, um, I should be okay. calling it ibuprofen, yeah. That's the only thing in them, basically? Yes, ibuprofen is, is Advil, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, yeah. And, um, Ibuprofen can uh, affect your kidneys too. I've, I've had people come in with uh, kidney failure from taking ibuprofen, and uh, fortunately, it, it can be reversed once we stop that. Yeah. Birth control pills can cause high blood pressure. Um, weight loss medications. 
I, some people that have high blood pressure are overweight, they, they want to take a weight loss pill, I, I, you know, I won't give it to them until their blood pressure is down. I usually avoid those and older people too because they can cause your blood pressure and can trigger a heart attack or a stroke or something. Illicit drug use, um, methamphetamine, cocaine, stimulants can raise your blood pressure as well. Any questions regarding this slide or any other? Yes, sir. What about CBD? Um, I don't know what that does for blood pressure. Um, I know that um, THC, which is the psychoactive component in marijuana, um, does raise your blood pressure heart rate temporarily, shortly after ingestion, but after you know, 45 minutes to an hour, I believe it does go down. Unfortunately, it's hard to do studies on CBD and THC because it is still illegal under the federal government, um, even though we have it in California and Nevada. Um, it's, um, it's hard to do studies on it. A lot of the information is just anecdotal. Guys come into the emergency room and he just smoked marijuana, his blood pressure's high, and you know, so, but then he's also in the emergency room. So we're not really sure the effect um, of marijuana products on blood pressure. I don't think there's any long-term blood pressure problem related to marijuana product use. Yes? So if a person, if a body is exposed to repeated exposure to high blood pressure, does it uh, recover from that exposure? Does it uh, incur cumulative permanent damage? Good question. It, it does incur permanent damage, yes, depending on how high it is and for how long. Um, it affects, I mentioned, the heart muscle. Uh, we see conditions where the, the heart doesn't relax properly. Uh, we have, when we measure blood pressure, the top number is systolic, the bottom number is diastolic. And people always ask me what's the more important. They're, they're both important. If, you're, if your bottom number, your diastolic number is high, that means your heart is not relaxing well. And we, we can see this in um, echocardiogram where people have a condition called diastolic dysfunction and we know that leads to heart failure. Um, we also see a condition I mentioned, left ventricular hypertrophy, which is enlargement of the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber, and that leads to heart failure. But with proper treatment, this can be reversed. If this has been going on for 20 years and somebody just shows up in my office um, and they've had high blood pressure for 20 years, it's harder to reverse some of those conditions. Uh, I mentioned the kidney problems. Um, they've also done long-term studies on people with high blood pressure, big population studies, and the bottom line is the higher your blood pressure, the shorter you live, the lower your blood pressure, the longer you live. So it, it, is, a, it is a significant thing. And um, in my opinion, it's easy to treat. Um, okay, yes? Is your focus now more on the systolic or the diastolic? Okay, um, it, it's kind of both. Yeah, it is both, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it, it keeps changing. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's pretty interesting. Even amongst all the experts in the high blood pressure field, there's a lot of divergent opinions. Um, so I, I tell people both are important because if the bottom number is high, then you don't get the heart to relax well, and um, that's not good. And if the top number is high, you know, you can have a stroke or blow out of blood vessels. So, so they're both important. Um, in Europe, they allow they, they say that blood pressure can go up to 140 over 90, um, or even 150 over 90 in older people. And um, in 2014, there was a big um, controversy about what blood pressure numbers we've been using. And there's a committee that meets every six or seven years called the Joint National Council of Hypertension. And they last met in 2014. And they really, there's a lot of divergent opinions. Um, about three years ago, I think it was November of 2015, there was a trial called the SPRINT trial. And um, something systolic pressure, uh, I don't remember the whole acronym, but, um, and what that trial looked at is people that were at high risk, people that had heart disease, strokes, um, they weren't healthy people. And they found in this study that it's important to get you to 120 over 80. Um, that people had way less heart attacks and strokes if their blood pressure was 120 over 80. And I think the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association had adopted that number based on the SPRINT trial. So you were going to ask me a question. Well, you might have just answered my okay. question. I tend to have very low 
blood pressure, can that reach a point where it's dangerous? Like, I, I can come in at like 116 over 65. You're lucky. Yeah. Oh, so that's yeah. good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Okay. So you have normal blood pressure. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Just right. so you don't get lightheaded and dizzy. Um, okay. You might you know. break Moses' record. <laughs> <laughs> um, symptoms of low blood pressure are dizziness and lightheadedness, especially when you're standing up. Um, uh, low blood pressure is a blessing, in my opinion, unless, you know, most people with low blood pressure don't really uh, faint or get lightheaded very often because they're adapted to it. So that, that's actually a good thing to have. So you're lucky. <laughs> I, you know, recently there's, there's a concern that people when they're, it's, this is more in older people, when your lower number gets down below 60, that's actually kind of bad for you. So we, we, we don't want the number, if you're on medicine and you're older, to get below 60, the diastolic number because your outcomes get worse. I'm not sure the reason, I don't know if it's, but that, that's a cardiovascular effect. I, I don't know why that's happening, but yes. What about the use of aspirin in high blood pressure? I was reading that if, if you've had a cardiac event, that it's good, but if you haven't, then maybe you should. Right, that's that, you're right. Um, so aspirin is not helpful for high blood pressure is helpful to prevent a heart attack and stroke. But what we're finding is that a lot of people are getting bleeding ulcers, um, um, kidney problems um, from, from aspirin. So if, if people are healthy, um, they, just, they just published a study this year, a healthy, even older person, we're not recommending aspirin anymore. If, you have, if you're healthy and you don't have any risk factors, um, if you've had a heart attack or you were at high risk for heart attack, I still recommend low dose aspirin. If you've had a stroke, definitely need to be on aspirin. Any other questions? Okay, let's see what we got now. Okay, so we kind of touched on a lot of these already. Um, eating smart is really important. Um, try to, you know, if you have children or grandchildren, try to get them on a healthy eating program now. Um, we're seeing an epidemic of childhood obesity in our country. Uh, it's really sad. Um, so eating smart is very important. A lot of us um, older people were kind of set in our ways. I know I've really been trying to eliminate meat products as much as I can from my diet and processed foods. Um, really help my cholesterol, yeah. Um, start an exercise program. We touched on that briefly. Uh, again, uh, 30 minutes five days a week or 150 <laughs> minutes per week, not per day. <laughs> you can get it all in one day if you want. But, <laughs> but uh, um, 150 minutes per week. That's the number I see over and over again. Smoking, we talked about. Um, very bad for your blood pressure. People, when, when I'm questioning a patient about their family history and they said, yeah, my dad had a heart attack at... 55, did he smoke? Yep. So, you know, that to me, that's all from smoking. Um, strokes, smokers have a lot of strokes. Um, family history of stroke. It's a question I ask, did they smoke? Yep. A lot of the post war generation smoke. Thank God, less and less people are smoking these days. Again, now we should have tobacco products in there rather than just smoking all tobacco products. And vaping, as I mentioned, is very popular now. I see young people walk around with this smoke cloud going over them. And, that, that's not good, so it's a very concentrated form of nicotine, so we're not sure that's really good for you. Getting very popular. Um, alcohol, we talked about. The effects of alcohol, uh, initially when you have a drink, your blood pressure will go down, um, but after alcohol wears off, it goes back up. Uh, people that drink excessively, it's extremely hard to control their blood pressure. I, I have a real difficult time with all doctors, not just me, but uh, we have a difficult time controlling their blood pressure and people that, that drink, you know, maybe four, more than four or five drinks a day. Stress reduction, we, we talked about that previously. Um, um, that, that's very important. Um, you know, you can do meditation in your, in your home and you don't, you don't have to get all fancy and go to a yoga class or meditation class. Um, now there's even apps. If you guys have smartphones, there's apps for meditation talks you through the whole thing. Um, but basically what yoga and meditation do, it slows down your breathing rate and um, it actually lowers your heart rate. 
it's been shown um, meditation yoga to lower your heart rate, lower your stress level, lower the level of adrenaline in your, in your system. Any questions on this slide? Yes, sir. Um, I have two part questions. So yeah. First part is, you, know, you, you can go to your community the drugstore for CVS by days, they have the amazing pancakes and stuff like that, and the and peas there. Uh, and I do that just to say I love it. But I noticed that eating smart, it doesn't make a big difference. And I even drive it up and down there. Eating smart? Aren't eating smart? Maybe it's because I just, oh, shoot, the pressure's up. What did I do? Oh, I did that with burger and fries and milk and rice. Okay, you guys yeah. eat healthy. Uh huh. And I'm trying to find out how much I get away with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, so, and, uh, yeah, I hear you eat smile bags. I just can't figure out, all right, what's, what's the level? Would it be benefits to talk to, to a nutritionist and say, okay, don't pay you, all right, you should do this? Well, you, you could and, talk to a nutritionist, you could look it up online, but basically it's, uh, you know, reduced processed foods. As I mentioned, anything that comes in a bag, a box, or a can is probably bad for you. And, uh, and if you're eating, at any type of fast food restaurant, um, that's probably bad for you too. Yeah, so you um, go to dinner, you have the dessert. Oh, well, so went for two days, three days, whatever, and it goes back to the normal one. And it's like, oh, okay, should I? And then the doctor says, well, as long as it's not a lifestyle, I just want to do two weeks of it, it's okay. Yeah, mo mo uh, you know, moderation, I think, is the key in, in a lot of things in life. So, yeah, I tell my patients moderation. You know, if you're going out on Saturday night for a nice meal and you want to splurge a little, you, you know, once a week. You know, uh, if you okay. have to, well, yeah. Sometimes eating smart, you can't get enough calories. And I'll tell you, I need some calories. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, one thing I, I don't have on the slide is plant-based diets are getting more and more popular. Um, uh, that's getting off of all meat, dairy, um, eggs. Um, it, it, it's, it's kind of a uh, big craze now. Um, Dr. Bergner. One of my colleagues who works here at the Wellness Center, he's a big proponent of plant-based diet. Him and his wife have been on that for, for years. It, your cholesterol goes way down. Um, plants um, don't really produce cancer. Uh, meats, um, processed foods are what would cause a lot of cases of cancer. Um, I read about the B12 they're missing a lot, of, right? So I, when, when you do Oh, a vegetarian can be low in B12. Yes, if, if a person's a vegan or vegetarian, I recommend they take a B12 so they supplement. Take the B12 yep, that's pretty easy. You can buy B12 that's over the, the counter. Meat, that's, the only thing that's the only one, yeah. Because mm -hmm. of the meat and stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, sir. Coffee. Okay, good question. Um, coffee raises your blood pressure for about 30 to 45 minutes or an hour after ingestion, but then it goes back to normal. They, coffee is actually looking like it's good for you. Um, they, seriously, um, it's not because I'm a coffee drinker, um, but they actually did a study recently that showed that people that drank coffee lived longer than people that didn't. And there also was a study done in people with advanced liver disease, cirrhosis, and coffee has some kind of beneficial effect on the liver. Um, coffee is uh, high in antioxidants, um, so I have people that have bad liver disease and their liver doctors recommend they drink two to three cups of coffee a day. Yes? But doesn't that negatively affect your kidneys? Not, no, mm -mm. nope, no, mm -mm. Yeah, you, you urinate from it, but that's because you're drinking, uh, you Is know. Is that just straight, no, no cream or sugar? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I, I, I didn't know if they uh, included that in the study or maybe I skipped over that part. Um, I, you know. Cream and half and half is pure cholesterol. I, I stopped using cream in my coffee probably 10 or 15 years ago. Um, I, I put a little honey in for a sweetener in, in my coffee. Um, probably black coffee is a better That's choice. Right? I'm not sure what was done in the study. That's a really good question. I, I might, like I said, I might have a, I, I don't know if they had that as a, as a variable, uh, cream and sugar or straight black coffee in those studies. I, I, sorry. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Foods that can lower your blood pressure. Um, all these foods listed here do lower your blood pressure. Um, celery has like a natural diuretic in it. Um, you know, you think of a lot of medications actually come from plants and, and um, natural sources. And some people that are really holistic, uh, I'm not taking a drug, but a lot of drugs uh, come from plants and molds and penicillins from mold. 
Um, so that's why people can get allergic to it. Is people are allergic to mold. They can be allergic to penicillin. So drugs, you know, we, we try to avoid them, and, but they, they can save your life and make you live longer. Um, Omega-3 oils, that's pretty, been pretty well established. That's found more in um, cold water fish. Uh, berries, like blueberries, blackberries, uh, the dark berries. We've got nice raspberries and strawberries on there. They're good for you. But, but the dark purple pigment has something in that that lowers your blood pressure. Pomegranates, um, they have an effect similar to um, ACE inhibitors. They increase nitric oxide in your, inside your arterial wall which relaxes your artery and lowers your blood pressure. So I uh, recommend people eat the dark purple fruits and vegetables. Um, a lot of, uh, nowadays we're saying eat a lot of different colored foods, you know, um, include some yellow peppers and, you know, different, all the different colors. The more colors you have, the better, okay? Um, black beans, they lower your blood pressure. Whole grains, dandelion can lower your blood pressure. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, there's dandelion tea. Um, I think you can even buy dandelion in a health food yeah. store. Um, I grew up in Chicago, and um, it's a very ethnic city. There's a very large Italian population, and when the dandelions were blooming, a lot of people would go out in these fields, and they were just picking the dandelions, and they, I, you know, I never really went to ask them what they were making it into, but uh, I was just a kid back then. But. <laughs> Ah, questions. <laughs> Good, I saved some time. Oh, it's almost seven. <laughs> yes? Um, is taking fish oil um, a good idea? I, I take fish oil, yeah. Um, I, I think it's a good idea. Um, it's good for your brain. Um, it's good for your cardiovascular health. It's a natural blood thinner. It helps your joints. Um, I, I do take a fish oil supplement. Better, better than the omega-3 pills? Well, it, it, uh, fish oil is omega-3. Okay, so you want omega-3. And, and what you really want is it's DHA and EPA. Okay? Um, there are, try to find a fish oil supplement that it, it's high in uh, DHA and EPA. I just wondered um, if fish oil was better than even the pills. Well, I mean, if you, I mean, eating the fish is probably oh, the best the thing. Um, the, oh, I meant like you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Cod liver oil is good for you. It's a fish oil, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a cold, cold fish. Yeah, so yeah. So I wonder yeah. if the oil was better than uh, taking the supplement, but not necessarily. Well, it's probably better. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, yeah. And fish oil, you know, sadly, as you guys all probably all know, the oceans are really contaminated with mercury. So. Try to look um, for fish oil that says mercury-free. They can actually extract mercury from fish oil through some kind of process um, in, pro in the processing of the fish oil. So try to get mercury-free. Um, that is a supplement. Um, with, with supplements, um, supplements aren't super well studied, um, but don't buy the, you don't have to buy the most expensive, but don't buy the least expensive because you're not gonna get as good a product. And if you're trying to do it for your health, um, I, like I said, my, my uh, supplement is DHA and EPA. And uh, you can, I, I order that online. It's too hard to find in the store. Um, yeah. So um, there's a company called Pure Encapsulations. Um, um, Amy Smith, who's a uh, practitioner over here in the Wellness Center, she recommends that company, Pure Encapsulations. Um, well, um, it's a very, uh, has a very good reputation. Um, and that's where I get my DHA and EPA. Yes, sir. You know, it, I think it depends where it's farmed. Um, uh, it can be a concern. Um, I think if you do eat farmed fish, it's better to eat ocean farmed fish rather than lake farmed fish. I don't know if they're farming fish in lakes too much, but lakes in a lot of areas are very contaminated and you know the, the cold water fish they like to go to the bottom and that's where a lot of the pollutants are the mercury goes to the bottom um, all the other terrible stuff that's in our environment it sinks to the bottom of lakes so um, a lot of I don't know a ton about fish farming but I know Norway and Chile they, they do a lot of fish farming in those countries um, 
The thing um, with farm salmon, um, I try to avoid it. Um, I don't buy it. I'm, I'll order salmon at a restaurant and I'll ask them and, you know, if it's farm, sometimes I won't order it because they, they feed them like some kind of a feed. It's not like a natural salmon. Um, and then they add coloring to make it look uh, orange. Uh, farm salmon comes out white, which, you know, so yeah, I, yeah, I tend to avoid that myself, but. Uh, Alaskan wild caught, like Trader Joe's. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the best, yeah, yeah. That's okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. wild caught, that's what okay. you want, wild caught, that's, that's what I buy. Okay. At Trader Joe's, it's good stuff, yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, sir. So, so you mentioned some things that cause blood pressure, uh, high blood pressure, kidney, and whatever, which goes in that pressure, but what about the reverse pressure, like high pressure by itself, does it cause some other undesirable reaction? If I liken it to your mechanical pumping system pump, Flowing, say a food processor that's flowing, say 30 feet aside, and you're supposed to inject some EMTA and 30 feet aside, and some green tea, and all of a sudden your pressure goes above that, say, hey, those injectors aren't injecting stuff because my blood pressure is going. So, in that sense, does high blood pressure have some other? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I kind of alluded to that with my little pump analogy. So, yeah. so the higher your pressure in your pumping system, the the pump, the pump's going to wear out, you know, or get tired. Or well, yeah, but within, within the body, so what does it, so, what within the body uh, says, hey, blood pressure twice, so I'm not going to create certain minerals or certain interesting Well, blood pressure doesn't affect minerals at all. It, it, it's just, um, like I said, it's more of a, it's a cardiovascular disease um, and a kidney disease as well. But, you know, your kidneys, you know, they filter your blood all 24-7, 360. I mean, your kidneys never rest. Your organs never rest. Mm -hmm. so, so if you always have high pressure in your system and your organs are working while you're relaxing, the organs are going to wear out sooner, and that, that's essentially what we see in a simple analogy. Okay. Yeah, the, the organs wear out, and typically it's the heart, you know, or the or the blood vessels. Yes. Have you encountered patients that have wild swings in blood pressure? Yes. Like very high to very low. Yes. Many yep. And, yep. And an easy um, there, yeah, that that that's a, those are the toughest patients. Um, some of those people have. Um, Neurologic disorders, autonomic nervous system disorders. Um, if if I suspect that, um, there's a hypertension, a high blood pressure specialist in Reno that I refer people to, and he, he does. Yep, yep, yeah, he's excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have a patient that's had a heart attack, and he has this labile hypertension. Labile means it goes up and down all the time, and so he can go from 180 uh, down to you know, 90, you know, in, in 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, and uh, he's fallen down, he's got scars all over from fainting, and he sees Dr. Block as well. Um, and um, those are very difficult patients to treat, because if it gets too high, then, God forbid, a heart attack or stroke, if it gets too low, you're gonna faint or fall over and end up in the emergency room or break your hip. And so th those, fortunately, it's pretty uncommon. Thank goodness. Um, some people, um, with um, less wild swings in blood pressure. It, it can be stress-related or lifestyle-related. Um, and again, in those people, I really value the home blood pressure readings. Yes? Is there a better time of day to take the home? Thank you for asking that, yeah. First thing in the morning is recognized as, a, as the most important time. Most heart attacks and strokes occur between 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. and what happens in our bodies is around 4 a.m. our adrenal glands wake up before we do. And the adrenal glands start to secrete adrenaline and cortisol and those two hormones, naturally occurring hormones, raise your blood pressure. Well, if you've got a narrowed coronary artery that you never knew about, God forbid, and you, you, know, you get this spike of uh, these hormones, that, that triggers a heart attack and, uh, and a stroke. Can. Yeah, they usually occur. I often ask my people that have had a heart attack, what time it happened? Oh, 3.30 in the morning, oh, 5 in the morning. Um, yeah, 6 in the morning, yeah. So morning blood pressure readings are very important. Um, I tell people, you know, after you roll out of bed, take your blood pressure. If it's high then, you got a serious issue. You know, um, a lot of us um, get up and drink coffee. I, I like you to take your blood pressure before you uh, drink any coffee. Um, and I, I like people to, um, you know, I mentioned relax. Um, ideally, if you're taking it at home, you want to use a table or a desk where the cuff is about the, the height of your heart. Your heart is about here. 
So um, make sure your cuff is about as high as your heart. Don't, don't have your cuff down here um, and don't have it like that. And don't do your blood pressure laying down because it's going to be low. You want to do it seated. Okay, that's, yeah. Well, well, again, you know, going back to the risk factor thing, um, you know, um, you know, I, you know, if it's if it's over, you know, consistently over, you know, 130 in in in, in the mid 80s, I may up a medication or make some suggestion, especially first thing in the morning. Well, that's that's a strong indicator we need to adjust something because. Later in the day, after you've been, if you're working or you've had a stressful day, um, your blood pressure is going to rise throughout the day, and then it tends to go down after you get home into your safe environment. So we do like the first morning blood pressure. Um, if it looks like you have high blood pressure, sometimes we'll have you take it at the end of the day too, just to see, hey, what's it like after you've been working? Is it 200 over 120 after, after working? You know, we need to know that. So. Um, but if you only have one time a day to take it, take it when you roll out of bed. Yes? Mine is consistently high. Mm -hmm. It never goes low. Right. It used to be so low that they could hardly even read it. But now it's so high that I'm on four different medications and it's still high. Hmm. I mean, and I don't do it anyway. Wow. And it's still, you know. Wow. And I take it all day long. I hmm. take it. Hmm. And it's in the 180s, 90s. Wow. I would, you know, I would. Talk to your doctor about that. Um, that's pretty. I just, keep, I just keep my two digits, keep taking your blood pressure, and then I have an appointment every three months, and then mm -hmm. I bring in my list and show. Hmm. But I'm on four different medications. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have, you know, we can add, there's a couple more we could add on you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, sometimes. Um, yeah. This is alarming to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you feel like um, your physician is not addressing your, your issue or your concern, then I would consider asking for a referral to a hypertension specialist um, or a cardiologist. Um, um, it renowned, sorry? Hypertension? Hypertension specialist. Okay, and then whoever you say? Uh, or a cardiologist, okay. yeah. I've had um, all the tests. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you take them all every day. You don't skip any days. Never. Okay. Never. Hmm. Same time every single day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, yeah. You need to get with your physician and get get to the bottom of that and um, see if there's anything else. Um, well, I did smoke, and then I stopped smoking, and then I did the vapor thing, and now, and then I realized, well, I'm still doing the nicotine. What's the difference? Are you still doing nicotine so now? I don't do vapor with nicotine. Ah. Okay. I try, I'm okay. Yeah. Like because nicotine will, will, yeah, the, the vape pens will raise your blood pressure. Yep. If, there's no nicotine, if there's no nicotine, um, what's in it then? It's just a flavor or something? Yeah. Or? That should be neutral on your blood pressure, yeah. Okay, so that would be fine. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then sadly, um, people that have smoked a good part of their life, um, their arteries get very stiff. And it's really, it can be really hard to control their blood pressure. Because uh, smoking causes your arteries to form calcium deposits and mm. Mm. but then I, I quit you know I, well I'm not easy to I've stopped now and then. I think the longest was for like fifteen years or something. And then his parent dies and then you know I have nothing else to do so I start smoking. Yeah, yeah. But now I'm doing the baby thing, but I'm also doing Yeah, as long as you're not getting nicotine then that should be neutral. But um, it could take like a year or two for your blood pressure to come down fully after you've had your last dose of nicotine. I mean it Seriously, can take a long time. And then, unfortunately, the longer you've smoked, the harder it is to uh, control. So you could be, a, you know, you know. The, the other thing too is I, you know, you can up the doses. I don't know what your doses are. I mean, we don't need to talk about this tonight. But you know, make sure that you're on like, you know, significant doses of these medications, which I'm sure you are. Okay. So you're a candidate for that medication I was talking about, spironolactone. Yes. Are you on that? No. Ah. Not that I know. Okay. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I just Write that down. Spironolactone. Okay. Because that, that, what I, you know, what I do with people like you is I get them off their potassium and start them on spironolactone because spironolactone keeps the potassium in your body. Because the reason that you have low potassium is because you make too much of that aldosterone hormone yeah. that we, we talked about. Yeah. Yeah.
That's probably you, I'm guessing. I mean, uh, Do I make too much of that? Probably, probably, yeah. So spironolactone, usually once I get my patient on that, if I'm seeing their potassium's low and their blood pressure's bad, that's like the magic bullet. I call it the magic bullet. Um, <laughs> spironolactone. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, you know, blood pressure, it, it, I, I look at it like it's like a wave in the ocean. Right. I mean, it's, you know, all day long, um, it's going up and down. When, when I was an intern and a resident, um, back, in, back in my day, um, <laughs> we used to, if we had people in the intensive care unit, we would uh, use an uh, intra-arterial line. We'd stick a, a catheter into their radial artery, usually the radial artery, uh, in the wrist, and then we can monitor their blood pressure. And... Most of these people are in the intensive care unit, but you know they'd be laying in bed, and you could watch if you, you know, their blood pressure even that like it's it's just like a wave, you know. And so, um, I tend to use averages because I have people bring in their readings, and you know I try to get to an average. Um, you know, when people bring in their readings with me, I, I I tend to try to throw out the outliers, the real high and the real low, because those can be an error or just you know, try to look at the more consistent readings and what's your average, you know, so that, you know, and some of these new um, uh, um, monitors can give you an average. Um, now I've had people have apps on their phone that they download the blood pressure into their app and it'll give them the average blood pressure. It'll, it'll show a graph of what it was for the last 30 days. So if you have high blood pressure, I mean, some of these apps and things on these smartphones are pretty cool and it's helpful for your doctor when you go to your doctor go. So you don't care if someone's yeah, what, whatever their average is is what I care about because you, you are going to fluctuate, you know, a lot, you know, during the day. Okay, well, thank everybody for coming. Uh, you all asked a lot of nice questions. And thank you.